Buzz Aldrin is best known for being one of the first two humans to walk on the moon during the Apollo 11 mission in 1969. Along with Neil Armstrong, Aldrin landed on the lunar surface and spent about two and a half hours outside the spacecraft, conducting experiments and collecting samples of the moon's surface. Aldrin was also the first person to take a selfie in space, and he played a significant role in the development of space exploration and technology. After leaving NASA, Aldrin became an advocate for human missions to Mars and has been actively involved in the space industry, working on concepts such as reusable spacecraft and space tourism. Interestingly, back in 2009, Buzz talked in an interview about space exploration and said that a new mission into space will reignite the public's interest. However, at the end of the interview he detailed that there's a monolith on the surface of Phobos and said that we should go and investigate it. He said the following, Visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around Mars once in seven hours. End quote. The Phobos monolith is an object that has been proposed to exist on the surface of Phobos, which is one of the two small moons of Mars. The idea of a monolith on Phobos gained attention in the 1970s when the moon was first photographed up close by the Viking 1 and 2 spacecraft. The monolith was initially suggested to be a large artificial object, possibly created by an extraterrestrial civilization. However, subsequent high-resolution images and closer observations by more advanced spacecraft have only caused more questions to arise. Today, most scientists believe that the Phobos monolith is simply a natural geological feature, such as a large boulder or a rock formation, that appears unusually smooth and rectangular in shape due to erosion and other processes on the Moon's surface. However, without going there and conducting experiments, some are of the belief that the mysterious object was placed there on purpose, noting that nothing in the surrounding area matches the strange object. The Phobos monolith mystery is amplified by the fact that Phobos is completely barren. Whilst Mars has an atmosphere and a weather system, Phobos sits silently in space, with its solitary monolith pointing up towards the heavens. What's more is that Phobos is tiny, compared to the grand scale of the universe, making the sight of something so massive atop of a small celestial body even more creepy. The effects of erosion are common for strange discoveries on other planets. Mars itself has been the subject of many strange discoveries, such as the Mars face, the Mars pyramid, and even the levitating spoon. These rock formations are usually a result of our perspective from Earth, as well as millions of years of rock degradation. While interesting to many, Phobos has yet to receive any significant research or space exploration. Optech and the Mars Institute have proposed that the site of the monolith be investigated. This mission is referred to as PRIME fully known as the Phobos Reconnaissance and International Mars Exploration. The proposed mission would see a lander touchdown on the surface of the Lonely Moon to take samples of the Moon's geology. Currently, the Prime mission is not set to go ahead, and talks of funding are next to non-existent. In fact, when Aldrin discussed the idea of sending a mission to Phobos, he said the following. When people find out about that, they are going to say, Who put that there? End quote. Cryovolcanoes on Ceres In the main asteroid belt that sits between Mars and Jupiter lies Ceres, the largest of the asteroids. Ceres, first discovered in 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi, was originally classified as a planet. This was until other large objects were discovered in the same neighborhood as Ceres. Astrologists at the time realized they were looking at a new type of object in space, so the term asteroid, meaning star-like, was first coined to describe these new objects. In the 1860s, it was widely accepted that these large asteroids had major differences to the planets we know, but a specific definition of planet was never formulated. At the 2006 Pluto debate, it was discussed the specific criteria that had to be met in order for an object to be considered a planet. Had it not been for a modification to this criteria stating the planet must have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit, Ceres would today be the fifth planet from the Sun. Obviously, due to the asteroid belt it lies within, Ceres is not classified as a planet but a dwarf planet and an asteroid simultaneously. Now, whilst the controversy surrounding Ceres's classification is certainly interesting, that's not what we're going to discuss today. Ceres itself, 
is home to something much more fascinating. Since early 2015, NASA's Dawn spacecraft has orbited the icy world of Ceres, examining its surface closely. It wasn't until quite a few months had passed that the Dawn would observe something so fascinating but so bizarre at the same time. It was a 13,000-foot-tall mound closely resembling what we know as a volcano. Scientists named it Ahuna Mons. In 2016, it was confirmed that Ahuna Mons was indeed a volcano, but not your average volcano, a cryovolcano. A cryovolcano is, as you can imagine, a volcano, but with a twist. Instead of releasing molten rock or lava like the volcanoes we have on Earth, a cryovolcano erupts water, methane or ammonia. The water and other gases released often turn into a solid form once exposed to the low temperature surrounding the volcano, hence the more colloquial name ice volcanoes. These eruptions are referred to as cryomagma or cryolava. During eruption, they are liquid but are also released as a vapour. Cryovolcanoes are thought to be able to form on moons and asteroids that used to have an abundance of water. The reason Ahuna Mons erupts water and other substances rather than magma is simple. The temperatures on Ceres are simply too cold to melt rock, but warm enough that ice can melt. Ahuna Mons was only able to be understood more when scientists examined mineral salt, likely the product of a cryovolcanic eruption. Inside the Okator crater found it had origins in Ahuna Mons, which in turn relates both fascinating natural structures. The Okator crater is 57 miles across and as deep as Ahuna Mons is high. The large impact that tore the giant Okator crater into the surface of the dwarf planet must have originally started everything and triggered the later cryovolcanic activity, says Andreas Nathus, framing camera lead investigator for Max Planck. After this event, rock around the planet reshuffled and moved up towards the surface. The change in pressure allowed water and dissolved gases to escape that would eventually form a volcano. It's also suggested that many smaller explosions around the dwarf planet caused the cryovolcanism rather than one major event. Cryovolcanism isn't exclusive to Ceres though, as it has been spotted on Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, Europa, a moon of Jupiter, and Triton. Neptune's largest moon. Cryovolcanoes are a fascinating insight into the wonders of the universe and things we couldn't even imagine being possible. Space Tourism Company to Launch Commercial Flights to the Stratosphere by 2024 Travelling to space, a concept that, until recently, was nothing more than a wishful fantasy straight out of a sci-fi novel or TV show. Well, now Worldview Enterprises has entered the scene and they are planning on revolutionizing the spaceflight industry to make space flights accessible to a wider range of people. Worldview Enterprises was established 10 years ago in Arizona and is now offering a journey into space by using rocketless balloons that will travel straight up into the stratosphere. A far cry from Bezos's Blue Origin flight, the Worldview Enterprises experience will be an interesting endeavor to be sure. The balloons will lift voyagers 18 miles into the air. This is nowhere near as deep into space as the company's competitors offer. True space is said to begin at the Kármán line, 100 kilometers into space, though others argue it begins at 50 miles up. Blue Origin's flight can get you just above the Kármán line at 106 kilometers. The peak of the Worldview Enterprises flight might disappoint, but they are confident in their rocketless aviation, claiming it will be worth the once-in-a-lifetime experience. Clients will be able to witness the Earth's curve for the first time with their own eyes, as well as see the true darkness of space. CEO Ryan Hartman stated, We're redefining space tourism. Lamentably, the tickets start at $50,000, hardly a cheap venture for those curious about participating in the journeys. The flights are said to be between six and eight hours in length. Some journeys might last several days. The balloons are more accurately capsules that can hold up to eight people at a time. The company is planning on operating 100 flights annually over various historically or culturally important landmarks that will supposedly last five days. Some such destinations include the Great Barrier Reef, the Giza Pyramids, and the wonders of the world and the journeys are allegedly going to be smooth and gentle. Worldview Enterprises argue that, unlike Blue Origin flights, which use rocket power and suffer G-force, 
their balloon alternatives will allow people of all sizes and ages to traverse space. When asked about whether the worldview enterprise space travel is a joyride, CEO Ryan Hartman refuted it, saying it's much bigger and more important than most people realize. Hartman claimed he wishes to turn space travel into a commodity for all sorts of people from all walks of life, for families, for couples, for cosmos-loving individuals. Hartman believes that space is the future of the travel industry. The very first flight has already been entirely sold out by Space for Humanity, a non-profit organization that is offering the purchase tickets to anyone who wishes to participate but is unable to afford the relatively expensive tickets themselves. The first flight will begin in Arizona, near to the Grand Canyon. However, the company are hopeful that they might be able to add other landmarks to that list soon after they can prove how the world should invest in their idea. So, what do you make of this mysterious monolith? And what do you think it is? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comments section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.